Hey everyone and welcome to UK Media Warrior. Beauty and the Beast. Wow, okay. Um, it's almost a tale of two movies uh, in my regard. It's, it's been critically received across the board. I mean, it's in the 90s on the Rotten Tomatoes. It's smashed box office well, not records, but I mean, it's it's crushed in the box office. Over the, over the opening weekend, it was over 300 million worldwide. I mean, that's that's, that's ridiculous numbers. Um, and so it's, it's obviously very, very successful. But it's had its discussion points because a lot of people are asking, all the arguments are out there. Does Disney really need to make its animated classics into real life movies, into real life action movies. A lot of people say yes, some people say no. Um, I'm kind of on the fence. I mean, I've, after seeing Beauty and the Beast, I mean, obviously the Jungle Book did fantastic at the box office. Again, everything Disney seems to put out makes money and they are a business. They are possibly one of the most successful businesses in the world. They know how to how to make money how to make bottom line figures that's what they do but the problem becomes when does that desire to make money overtake the desire to do something new and fresh and creative and imaginative now obviously at the moment the superhero comic book films are doing fantastic and that's great because that is new you know whether superhero fatigue is starting to set in due to the sheer amount of superhero films we're getting. I would say yes, it is. But nonetheless, they brought out Marvel, they took the ball by the horns, they put money into a project that could have failed. Um, Marvel funded their first Iron Man, and it was a huge success. Disney looked at it and thought, okay, worth the gamble. So they bought Marvel, they put money into it, and it worked. And they're doing the same thing with their classics. They know their classic films are well received. Nearly all of their classic animated Disney pictures are critically acclaimed across the board. So they've got these hits on their hands already. And to them, it's just well, it's logical. It's like a no-brainer. You know, if we make these real life, real life action films, we're going to make loads of bank on it. And that's exactly what they're doing. Cinderella, Jungle Book, Beauty and the Beast now. They're all making tons of profit for Disney. But did they need to do it? I'm leaning towards the, no, they really didn't have to do this, but they saw a lot of profit, so they went down the profit route no matter what. And fine, okay, as I say, they're a business, it's what they want to do. I would have been more happy if they'd have done something more creative, something new but they didn't, so this is what we've got. Now, Beauty and the Beast is a, is a fantastic film. Um, its production budget was 160 million, which makes it the most expensive musical ever made. Okay, uh, Hello Dolly was uh, the previous record holder, I think it was like 25 million or something like that, whatever it was. Um, but now Beauty and the Beast has become the, the, the biggest budget musical of all time. And it's easily made back. It's, it's doubled, tripled its production budget already worldwide. So that's not a problem for Disney. Uh, they can put money into these things because they know they're going to get their money back. But the thing is, th there are a few niggling things. When I was watching it last night, you know, uh, uh, by the end of it, I was like, that was a really good movie. I really enjoyed it. And if I hadn't seen the original movie, if I hadn't seen the original animated movie, it would have been a ton better. But that's the problem. I have seen the original animated movie. I love the original animated movie of Beauty and the Beast. And this live action film is pretty much a frame by frame remake of that film with like three or four new songs or five song, new songs or whatever that are in it. But you've got the original songs, the ones everyone knows, you know, um, Be Our Guest, uh, the Beauty and the Beast song, you know, Gaston's song, they're, they're all in there. So you've got all the originals that you know and love. They've thrown in a few extra songs, fine. But other than that, it's exactly the same story. So after sleeping on it, I've come up with this uh, 
um, thought in my head, and I don't know whether it'll weigh out, I don't know if it makes sense to anyone else. For young kids, you know, up to about, I don't know, say 10, well, I'm just grabbing at a number here, but let's say kids 10 and below, they would enjoy the animated movie better, I think. Um, whereas above 10, they could probably appreciate this film, the, the real life, the actual live action film, better. Maybe 12 would be a better uh, uh, age group, I don't know. But what I'm thinking, when I was watching this film last night, there were, certain, there were parts of it that were quite scary. Um, and those parts, for, for example, one part where the wolves are chasing down Belle on a horse, and one of the wolves bites the horse's leg. And I think, oh, wow, you know, that's, that's pretty graphic. I mean, there were very young kids in the audience, obviously. But that scene is in the animated film, but it's different, isn't it? I mean, an animated cartoon is much different to seeing a real-life horse being in distress because what looks like a real-life wolf has bitten its leg. And, and also, by the time we were getting like two-thirds of the way through the film, I noticed some kids that were sitting uh, in front of me were getting bored. They were getting up and wandering around. They started to talk where they hadn't in the first half of the film. So perhaps it was getting a little bit too long for them. Um, perhaps live action Beauty and the Beast, live action fairy tales, don't hold them like the animated cartoon versions does. Now, as I say, I don't know whether that would hold up. I don't know whether it makes any sense to anybody else. But that, that was how I saw it. That was my perception of it, of, of the film. Now, as I said, I absolutely love the film. The, the songs are powerful. They hit you where they need to. The Beauty and the Beast song, as always, gets you right in the heart. You know, when you get that lump in your throat. And yeah, I admit, I was sitting there and I was starting to tear up a little bit watching it. And because that's the that's the songs that Disney do so well. They know how to push those buttons in everyone. They know how to get the emotional response. So those songs were fantastic. Um, the film, as I say, visually was incredible. I know there's been some discussion about whether the Beast CGI was really as good as it could have been. Yeah, I didn't have an issue with it. I mean... Okay, it's, it's perhaps less scary than the animated version, but they needed to show uh, Dan Stevens' facial expressions better for the live action film. So I, I can understand why they, they changed that. And it still worked. It was still fantastic to watch. Um, and the performances were also incredible. Emma Watson as Belle. I, I think out of all of them, and oddly enough, as she's supposed to be the star of this film, Emma Watson's portrayal as Belle was perhaps the least impressive out of everyone. Now, that's no knock against Emma Watson. She is obviously a great actress. I've seen her in other stuff. She's not say out of the park. I, I don't know what it was. I can't... I, I thought... At the time when I was watching, I was thinking that I was watching Hermione. I, I couldn't get that out of my head. Her tone, her inflection the way she was speaking, it, it was it was Hermione, it was just an older Hermione, I was just, uh, that's how I felt when I was sitting there in the cinema watching it, it felt like I was watching an older Hermione in Beauty and the Beast. Um, so I suppose that does come down to Emma Watson's portrayal of, of the character, but I'm not going to knock her because, you know, I love Hermione as, as in, in Harry Potter and the huge Harry Potter fan, and she did incredible in that, and like I said, I've seen her in other stuff and she's good. So... I'm not going to really knock her. She can obviously sing. <laughs> the girl can hold a, um, a tune, no problem whatsoever. Although even there, occasionally, when she got to the end of um, like a chorus or, or a part of the song, there was like a dunk. Like, like she just dropped it at the end slightly. I, I don't know. Once again, that was just my perception. To me, the best singing performance was by Luke Evans as Gaston in the, in the Gaston song with... Um, uh, Josh Gad, the two of them in, in the bar singing and everybody else singing about Gaston. That was absolutely fantastic. I love that. I had a huge grin on my face watching that. Luke Evans can sing. That man, that man is pretty good when it comes to singing. He's, he's okay on that. 
Um, the whole controversial Josh Gad playing the gay character in this, I didn't have an issue with that. I mean, yeah, okay, he was portraying the man as gay, but it wasn't that big a deal. It really wasn't. And LeFou in the animated version is obviously gay as well. They just don't push it like they do in this one, where he's obviously gay. But it, it wasn't a detraction. It was LeFou was a fantastic character. Josh Gad played him excellently, and he was... He was he was possibly the heart of the of the of the tale to a degree. Him, uh, Bell, and the Beast were, were like the the three parts that made up the heart of this 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 story. So I didn't mind that at all. Um, I did find it slightly odd that one of Gaston's three henchmen turned out to be a cross dressing gay by the end of the movie, who ended up in the big dance at the end uh, with LeFou. I thought that was a, <laughs> perhaps taking it just a tad too far, um, you know, but <laughs> whatever. And there was one other minor thing which, which it annoyed me. It's going to probably get a lot of hate from some people, and I don't mean it in a bad sense, but this film is supposedly set in 15th, 16th century France. They say it's in France. In the film, they say we are in France. They've all got French names. You know, and yet in the beginning, in the big dance scene at the very beginning where they're introducing the prince before he gets cursed, you've got a number of black female actresses dancing in the royal court. That wouldn't have happened. There were black people in, in, in Europe in the 15th, 16th, 17th century, but they weren't the sort of people you would have invited to court. And they most certainly wouldn't have been dancing in front of the king or the prince or whatever. So that was obviously just shoehorned in there once again um, to make the SJW people happy, to make the critics happy. So, oh, look how diverse we are. We've got black people in this fairy tale. But they're there for no other reason than that. And that doesn't make it acceptable. If you're going to put diverse races in a in a picture, make it believable, make it make it work, make it possible. I mean, this is gonna sound stupid, but when I was a kid, when I was young, and I was watching Disney and um, animated films like that, ones that were set in the past, in historical time references. It got me hooked on history. I, I grew to love history from watching things like that because I was thinking, you know, even as a kid, I was thinking, wow, you know, that happened in France at that time. I wonder what else happened. You know, let's, let's go and have a look. And I investigated and I checked stuff out and it, it made my love of history grow more and more. Also, two of the characters, um, the wardrobe and the, the feather duster that come to life as, as, as um, inanimate objects in, in in this movie, uh, both of which are in the animated film, have been changed from white characters into black actresses for this live action film. Once again, for no other reason than to be diverse. And once again, it wasn't required. You didn't have to do that. It's been established in all of the previous Beauty and the Beast stories and live action and um, musicals on stage that those characters are white. You don't have to change people's races just to make a statement. That's ridiculous. That's stupid. Minority races, and I hate to use that term because nowadays really they aren't, but it's the only thing people seem to understand. Minority races need more re uh, representation in films. They do. I am 100% behind that. Make new films, make fresh films, make p films that these people can be in. So that now everyday f TV shows that you see have got a mixture of Latino, black, white, Asian. They're all in it because that's the world we now live in. Don't take historical films, previous films, literature, you know, animated films that we've grown up loving and shoehorn in these diverse race of characters for no other reason than to make yourself look good. To my mind, that's not acceptable. Start coming up with imaginative, creative, excellent films that have these races in, that have blacks, whites, Asians, you know, 
Indians, whatever, have them in these films make new stories. I hate the way they shoehorn them into to previous stories that don't need them. There is no need to do that, and it makes you look stupid and desperate to please the SJW warriors out there, you know, who are causing all the faff on YouTube, and whatever. You don't need to do it. So that was a bit of a downer for me when I saw they'd done that for no other reason other than to look good, uh, you know, and to help their PR. But it didn't detract from from the film because the film is absolutely excellent. I absolutely loved it. It was it was it really was fantastic, and I can't recommend it enough. Obviously, everyone's probably going out and seen it, looking at the box office by now. But if you haven't, go and go and watch it. It's got some great actors in it. I mean, it's got you know, like I say, Luke Evans as Gaston nails it. Emma Emma Watson as Belle. She's good. She's just not as good as. Yeah, I mean, when you see her acting against Luke Evans, Luke is definitely better. When you see her acting against Kevin Klein as her father, Klein is definitely better. When you, even when she's sometimes in scenes with the Beast, um, Dan Stevens, even then sometimes you're thinking mm, there's a disparity in the acting performance here. So she's good, but I think I would have cast somebody else for the role. And there are a couple of scenes where she's in town and, and when she's in the castle, in the balls or whatever, and she's not the prettiest girl in the shot. And Belle's are supposed to be this exceptional beauty who makes all the other females around a pale in comparison. Emma Watson is gorgeous. But for some reason, in this film, when, she, when there are the other girls that were around her, some of them look more attractive than Emma Watson. So that was a bit weird. But anyway, um, that's pretty much it. As I say, love this film. I'm going to give this one a 9 out of 10. Definitely can't recommend it enough. Um, one of the best musicals I've seen in a long time. As I said at the beginning, I would say that for kids over 10 or 12, this is going to appeal to them more. They can probably have the attention span to keep up with it. And it will be more interesting to them because they're real people, live action people in front of them on screen. Below the age of 10 or 12, I'm going to say keep to the animated film. Let your young kids, four, five, six, seven year olds, watch the animated film, fall in love with that. That I feel would get their attention more than this one will. And then when they get older, introduce them to this. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you like this review, Please share it on your Facebook page or subscribe on YouTube. There'll be more along the way. Thank you very much. And you guys all take care for now. See you later.